Hey, everybody. That was an, that's an extremely difficult act to follow, but I'm <laughs> going to try my best. Uh, so great to meet all you guys. Uh, I'm Colin, here to talk about redefining intelligence and how reasoning is reshaping AI in 2025. So I think Sam already said that 2025 is going to be the year of agents. So today we're going to talk about agents. We're going to talk about reasoning models. We're going to do a couple of demos and kind of see where we see the technology going over the next like year or so. So very glad you're here to join me through this. Uh, yeah, I'm Colin. I head up the forward deployed engineering team at OpenAI. My role is going out and trying to make the technology work in the real world. So hopefully share a couple of examples of where it's working, one where it prominently did not, and uh, we'll all hopefully learn a lot. So quick summary of what our goal is is OpenAI. We want to build artificial general intelligence that benefits everyone. That is the kind of vision that, uh, I know some people laugh, and uh, that, is, that is the thing that, uh, that, we're, that motivates us. And what that effectively means is kind of represented by how we structure ourselves. So we're in kind of three main divisions in OpenAI. On the left side is research. And our research team is always dedicated to finding like the new frontier of what AI can do. So they're always trying to achieve AGI and then hopefully pass that, maybe super intelligence, maybe AIs that actually surpass humans in, 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 intellig in the level of their intelligence. Once they've found something that they think is useful, they pass it on to the applied team who tries to like productize that, make that useful so that people out there can try and use it. Because what we don't want is to try and develop AGI like in a lab. We need to kind of battle test it, put it in people's hands, and make sure that it actually has like utility uh, for people in their day-to-day -day lives. And that's where like ChatGPT or our API that people actually build on top of come from. And on the far right side is the deployment side where I work. And our job is to go out and find those, those like individual use cases, like work with a manufacturing company who's trying to work on the assembly line and be more efficient, or trying to work with a company trying to make their customer service more effective, and help them actually make it work in the real world, and then feed back to the research team why it didn't. So what we hope is that we end up with something that is practical and useful to everybody. Kind of up to you whether we're there yet, but we're certainly trying to get there, and this is the model that we're using to do so. So the agenda, I want to quickly recap like the current state of LLMs, because I think LLMs are like, they can do some very amazing things today. They also have some very like evident foibles. So we'll look at a couple of those. And then I want to move on to the important thing, which is focus on a couple of the advancements that are causing, I think, like a step change in what AI can do over the next like three to six months. And uh, a couple of use cases that I'm fairly interested in because they resemble use cases that I'm trying to implement with customers as we speak. And then we'll do a quick bit at the end of like what's coming next. So current state of LLMs. So I want to focus first on one of the not so good examples from the last year. So there was a, uh, an enterprising car company from, uh, from North America, and they listed a chatbot on their website. And they thought, what's the risk? It turned out that the risk is that you might be selling Chevy Tahoes for $1 <laughs> within, uh, within a couple of hours. So a prominent example of kind of the risks of these sorts of applications, and though I'm currently enjoying my $1 Chevy, Chevy Tahoe. It's a sign of like, the risks of not properly deploying this technology and not accepting the, like, the limits of the intelligence of the current level of models. However, there's also been some really prominent successes. So Morgan Stanley in investment banking managed to go live with an investment advisor that made all their investment analysts much more efficient. We've seen Ironclad use it for drafting contracts, actually in legal, an area with a very low risk tolerance, but actually they managed to make something that's effective with a human assisting the AI to be useful. And the last one, a local one in Germany, Zalando, used it to, for their uh, recommendation system, and they got a, a large, I think it was like a 23% increase in click-throughs in like much more personalized, much more like personal messaging that the LLMs were able to make. So definitely some use cases that are, that are, that are starting to emerge. But those are all kind of limited in scope, and many of those had like humans next to the AIs helping them actually make it happen. So what I want to focus on are like the advancements that are reshaping AI. And the area that I want to start is reasoning. We've just released a family of models called the O1 family. And this, these are our first models that can sort of think before they speak. So instead of just like popping out the first token that comes to mind, they actually do a sort of internal monologue, much like a customer, or much like a, a human would, and then produce an answer that's hopefully more thought through. So that's sort of the culmination of a number of different attempts we've made to increase the intelligence of models. So we had many series of models, and I don't want to focus, I don't want to, um, I don't want to focus on like each individual family because I think most of you are familiar, but basically 
for the GPT-3, GPT-4, GPT-4.0, for each of those, we were trying to train bigger and bigger models to be more intelligent. With the O1 family models, we're actually shipping smaller models that can think at the time you give them the question. So instead of trying to bake all the knowledge in at the start, we kind of teach them how to problem solve. So they're not replacing the earlier set of models because they take time, they cost more, because they have to think for a while before they give you an answer. But for certain categories of question, you might be OK waiting you know, 30 seconds, a minute, paying a little bit more if it's a very complex question that would have taken you like 30 minutes or an hour or hours to answer. So that is like the, the underlying like, tenet. The other thing I want to focus on is like just on the dates on the bottom here. It took us uh, 18 months to go from uh, to go from like the original uh, GPT-3 to GPT-4, whereas like the different versions of the O1 model have had only three months between them. So we've seen like an exponential increase in the speed at which we're innovating as well. So I think everything that we see here, even though these models still have limitations, those limitations are, are shrinking every like three months, two months that we see as new versions come out. So this is the other thing to keep in mind as we work through here. But let's focus on the O1 series. So the way the O1 models work is sort of, as I mentioned before, they, they think before they speak. They, they do an internal monologue, they work through, they might come up with a hypothesis, test it, discard it, and then come up with a new hypothesis. And the practical effect of that is that we're starting to see folks use them for domains that didn't use LLMs before because they couldn't trust them to operate at the level of, like, the level of reasoning that, that, that they required, like uh, mathematics, coding, science. There's actually a research institute in Germany who's currently using this for, uh, for a lot of their problem solving. And it's not the customer service department or the HR department. It's actually the research scientists who are starting to find the models be useful because they can reason through these like, very complex problems. And the reason why is something called te test time compute. And I don't want to focus on like, the, the massive details here, but the summary of these two charts is we took a base GPT-4 model, and we, tr and we trained it for a very long time at very high cost. And we managed to get its intelligence to move from on this, on this metric from 35% accurate up to about 70% accurate. However, when we took the same base model, and all we did was we let it think at runtime and try and problem solve. So we didn't train it for long, but, we at, but when we gave it the question, we allowed it to just think and think until it had an answer. The longer we let it think, the more intelligent it got until the point it hit about 80% accuracy. So a much more efficient model, a much smaller model, but actually got much better results than the older, bigger and bigger models. So it kind of flips the paradigm on its head. Maybe we don't have to keep training these massive models at the cost of months of, of training time if we can just make them think better at test time. And that is like the kind of premise behind these reasoning models. The other cool thing about the reasoning models is because they can think through problems, they're also our safest family of models so far. So we have a number of like red teaming tests that we do to figure out like how vulnerable these models are to jailbreak. And you can see on the bottom here, you know, like a lot of rejections for the GB, well, GPT-4.0 only rejected about 20% of these jailbreak attempts, whereas we get about 80% for the O1 models. So again, a lot of advantages to this kind of thinking approach. And that's unlocking use cases which like didn't used to be possible with these models. So, I'm going to demo reasoning for you in a second, but before I do that, I also want to focus on multimodality for a second, because this is the other kind of key thing that together are going to make us able to use agents in the real world. So just to get everybody on the same page, when we talk about modalities, you can think of those as an equivalent of like one of the senses of a person. So like, or like or almost, uh, it's like audio or video. You know, a person can see. We need the models to be able to see. A person can see a number of images in sequence. We need them to be able to do that. And Previously, you used to have specialized models that could do one thing. So they could take text in and text out. Or they could take text in and make an image. Or they could take an image in and make text. So they were useful, but you also had to stitch them together in very complex ways to actually make anything useful. Whereas what we're seeing now is a bit of a trend to these multimodal models. Things like GPT-4.0, which can just do all of these with a single API call. And it will just say, you know, you can talk to it and show it an image like you would do a person. And then it can respond by talking to you or giving you text back. And with this, we're starting to get like much more human-like interactions with the models. The last like, kind of barrier that we needed to get through was latency, because one of the biggest things where people feel unnatural when they're talking to AI is like it takes a while to come back to you, and it just feels like you're talking to a machine. And that is kind of the thing I want to 
play around with here, which is our new um, our real-time API. I hope folks in the room have been playing with it in ChatGPT or in the API, but I want to show you a couple of examples of it, and then I want to show a preview feature, which kind of shows how you can introduce another modality to make it almost that like angel on your shoulder that as you're working through things, it can see what you're working and you can talk to it. So let me just do that. I'm just going to have a sip of this first. And let's see where we go. Right. Hey, GPT, how are we doing? Hey, I'm doing great, thanks. How about you? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing great, thanks. I'm actually in Munich at a conference. Would you mind greeting everybody in German, French, and Italian, please? Sure. Hallo zusammen. <laughs> Bonjour à tous. Ciao a tutti. Hope everyone is having a great time. They certainly are. You, you should have seen the guy before me, actually. He's incredible. Um, but uh, um, I'm actually going to share some stuff with you. Would you mind? I'm just going to bring up a document here. And uh, can you see this OK? Yes, I can see it clearly. It looks like a document on aerodynamics. What would you like me to help you with? Yeah, uh, w w would you mind just telling me like what the colors on this chart mean? Sure. The colors in the chart likely represent airflow characteristics. Typically, cooler colors like blue and green indicate lower pressure or slower airflow, while warmer colors like yellow, orange, and red indicate higher pressure or faster airflow. It's a way to visualize how air moves around the car. OK, cool. That, that, is, that is super useful. Um, could you maybe explain, like, maybe, maybe in this diagram, like, what, does, what does the yellow refer to on this, uh, on this diagram? In this diagram, the yellow areas likely highlight regions of higher airflow velocity or areas experiencing greater aerodynamic forces. It's often used to show parts of the car where airflow is faster or more intense, which helps in understanding how the air interacts with the car's surface. OK, well, thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm actually strapped for time, so uh, I'm going to say bye. But thank you so much for your help. OK, amazing. So. Just quickly recapping what we did there. So we were able to have like a voice-to-voice -voice conversation. We changed language, all this kind of stuff. That's sort of like table stakes. I think people are just like used to and bored by that now. But the cool thing that we can now do is like share your screen and then have this, per have this AI sort of like on your shoulder, able to interact with everything that you can see. And right now, it can just talk. But what we're thinking about in terms of when people talk about agents, an agent would maybe actually go and start like editing the code. Or you would say like, oh, well, based on this contour chart, could you go and change my, my code so that we could do another test on this F1 car to bring down the downforce on the tail fin or something? And this is where, with reasoning, where we can tune them to think about these very complex domains, and then multimodality, we can interact with them in very natural ways that are like very different from how we used to use AI before. This is where we kind of see a lot of the value potential for agents. So, the last thing is agent capabilities. So again, Sam said that it's the that 2025 is going to be the year of the agent, where we start to see agents actually going off and doing things, and we trust them to complete certain level of tasks for us. And um, I think, like based on what we've seen so far, but like possibly true. Now, I, I just want to quickly recap, like what actually you know what. We're kind of low on time, so I'll, I'll skip to the I'll, I'll 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 rush to the demo. But the basic idea of an agent is you can talk to it and. It can call on different tools, and it can go and do long-running tasks. So instead of being this like straight input-output sort of uh, like chatbot use case, you can think of them as almost like the assistant that you can talk to. They go away, and then you get a ping on your phone like two hours later, and they're like, "Hey, I went and like researched the report that you asked me to do, and I brought it all together for you." These are the sorts of like long-running tasks that we want to start AIs start to move to actually create. And if you can do it with one agent then maybe you can start to deploy teams of agents that can work with each other and actually start to deal with more and more complex tasks. Again, I would say that this is still in like the very much the theoretical space, and we're seeing this deployed for like kind of simpler use cases. But with reasoning, then we're very hopeful that we can get to the point where you can start to trust these to do very difficult things. And I just have one other quick demo to show you to kind of illustrate this, which is in manufacturing. So for this one, sorry, wrong app. Um, so for this one, Pretend that you're a dealer at, a, uh, at an agricultural equipment company, and somebody comes in with their Japanese crop cutter, and they're like, this thing's drum is not rotating. I need to fix this. Can you please fix it? And you're like, well, sure, I'll try and fix that. I'm a mechanic. But what you find is that the manual for this is, first of all, in Japanese. And second of all, 
there's a couple of consequences of mishandling this thing, <laughs> which you, <laughs> I have no idea what this is, but, <laughs> but, I, but, I, know, but, I, but I know I want to avoid it. So, there, so pre previously, I'm not sure what you would have done in this sort of situation, but like, don't put yourself around the prop shaft of the running craft cutter is probably number one. But in this case, what we've done is we've used the reasoning models that with vision, now they can see images and they can read text. So we get them to read the text and interpret the images and then cache that in a nicely documented format. And then what we're gonna do is talk to it. And instead of us looking through the, uh, looking through the document, you can imagine the mechanic with like the person's equipment here and they're typing on the terminal. And it's gonna go and find the page and kind of evidence the recommendations that it's giving to the mechanic. So let's just try that out. So I'm gonna say my drum is not rotating. And let's see what it says. Ideally, oh, there we go, yeah, it finds the root causes. So it might be crops accumulating, it might be the friction clutch mounting bolt over tighten. I'm gonna say, um, how can I loosen the bolts? And a key thing with agents is a lot of the time, maybe you don't trust them. So in this case, we've asked it to evidence its work. So it's given us the page from the manual so that we can dig a little bit deeper if we want. But in this case, I'm fairly, clear, I'm fairly uh, comfortable that this is the bit where you remove the friction pad and retighten the bolts. So the last thing is that I would then have to take this Japanese manual and then look at my parts catalog, which is probably in German or English or whatever it might be, and then marry up the pieces and figure out how those kind of slot together. But actually, this is something that LMs are fairly good at as well. So I'm going to say, uh, can you suggest the parts to fix this? And I hope it says yes. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, and ideally, ah, there we go. Cool. Friction pad. Nice. And I'm going to say place order, and we're done. So just taking one step back, so much manufacturing in Germany, so many complex processes, and not even just in like the, the most complex, which is actually developing the, the cars or whatever they might be, but actually just in the servicing department, where there's like a huge network of people that need to understand thousands of models and tens of thousands of makes of cars. This is an area where we think LLMs could actually really make this just a lot simpler and a lot cheaper to do and, a lot, uh, and just like remove a lot of friction in this process. So that is just one of the ways that we see agents giving a ton of value in the next year or so. so just to recap, what's next? Um, sorry, I've overrun a little bit. Um, so in the past, it was all about asking questions of these models. And it was always this like one in, one out sort of, sort of modality. And we always wanted to check exactly what they said. And I don't think that's going to change. But I think what we're going to allow them to do is do more complex things. As long as they reference, as long as they check their work, and as long as we use the right level of like validation before we roll these things out, we're going to be able to do much more sophisticated things with these models in the coming year. So again, we, th we think 2025 is the year of agents. We think maybe even past that, or maybe in following years, we might even start to approach super intelligence where models are coming up with novel discoveries themselves. But I think for now, coming closer to matching our, our performance is, is a lofty goal. And uh, that is what we're targeting for 2025. So thank you all very much for listening. Hope that was informative. And uh, yeah, just really appreciate being invited out here. Thanks. Thank you.